G'day guys, welcome back to my channel, my name is Wildcard. Thank you for being here and watching my content. As always, it is my pleasure and privilege to talk about the greatest game in the world, rugby. And lucky Rugby Australia, I guess. They have made the front page of newspapers again. <laughs> Last time Rugby Australia made the front page of newspapers was when they offered $4.8 million to a 19 year old, the highest contract ever, to play rugby union instead of rugby league. And that was so stupid, it was laughed at by the entire country and made front page newspaper, okay? Uh, this time, they are also laughed at by the entire country, but hey, they did not have to spend $4.8 million to do so. So I'm guessing uh, that's a massive improvement for Eddie Jones and the CEO, or I, I mean, you know, the, the, the chairman, Hamish McLennan. I mean, yeah, you saved the money and you achieved the same thing. Well done. $4.8 million saved in the pocket. Um, really, that was really well done. Oh, oh, sorry. If you don't know what newspaper is, it's basically like your X feed and that's been tattooed onto toilet paper, essentially. Uh, so, uh, yes. So, basically, if you don't like what you're reading, you can wipe your ass with it. So, that's quite handy. And uh, if you don't know what X is, it's basically Twitter. Uh, it is Twitter, actually. And uh, if you don't know what Twitter is, it is basically newspaper. But... It's full of opinions and fake news. I know, actually, it is just newspaper, but like, yeah, online. Yeah, that's, yeah, there you go. There you go. And uh, yes, so with that being said, we're going to talk about Eddie Jones in a bit, about his, like, the circle of lies that's being un unveiled in front of us. But first up, let's talk about something good. Something that made me happy, right? Uh, Ireland versus the Springboks on the weekend was an absolute epic match of rugby. I mean, that was so close. It could have gone either way. I think, you know, either team could have won that game. Springboks obviously had issues with the goal kicking, had a few, you know, line out issues as well. And I, in overall, I actually felt like if Springboks didn't make those mistakes, could easily come out on top of that game. And Ireland as well, just almost perfect game the whole 80 minutes. And uh, yeah, like there's so much that can be deciphered out of this game. It's just... Just, I actually watched this game multiple times after this uh, in replay. It's just so, like, there was so much intricacies, so much little battles on the field uh, that it's just amazing to enjoy, right? But I think the most, the one thing that kind of, like, hit me the most in terms of just something, something really special is the singing of the Cranberries Zombie at the end of the match by the Irish fans. In case you don't know, the song Zombie is about the Northern Ireland conflict, uh, you know, the, the Protestants and the Catholics, Catholics are basically, uh, you know, once a United Ireland, the Protestants are basically British and they wanted to, to, to remain as part of, you know, the Great Britain and uh, the conflict that has, you know, you can go read about it. It's, there's so much horrendous things uh, people did to each other. And, uh, you know, the song is basically about that. And to see, you know, Ireland obviously represents all four provinces, including uh the northern northern ireland the 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 you know to see that fans from both side of the the divide essentially singing that song together i really you know i i, I was really you know I, I was i was a little bit emotional to be honest i thought i was really beautiful sight to see and you know to talk you know it's something that's you know yeah it's something that it's something that had like it's a scar that's so deep within the Irish population, they, the, the, for both sides to come out and kind of like acknowledge that with their voice. It's, uh, it, I thought it was just beautiful, beautiful moment in sport, actually. Ooh, did my thing just stop? Anyway, I think it's fine. Something just popped up, but it just disappeared. I don't know. Hopefully it's okay. Anyway, so yeah, I thought it was really nice. And um, yeah, beautiful moment in sport. And Johnny Sexton survived, which was good. But the news came out of the Springboks camp is obviously the referee review by Rassi Rasmus. And he was pretty happy with the referee. I thought the referee did a pretty good job. Ben O'Keefe was very concise. I mean, Ben O'Keefe is always good. He is the best in New Zealand. Brendan Pickerel was the TMO. And he also was stayed out of the, 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 the thing. I did think that, you know, the Ox Incher, uh, you know, putting his foot on Josh Van der Fleet's hand could have been something that if, uh, if it was an English referee, that could have been gone... You know, that could have been a, something happening there. Could have seen a car there. Uh, it's very unnatural the way that he, he, he kind of like, he was standing. So, 
if you're gonna say that he accidentally stood on Van der Feer's hand, mm. I, I I think it's it, it did it looked very unnatural the way he he was um, moving to put his foot uh, on Van der Feer's hand. So that's my opinion. You can let me know your thoughts. But I thought you know the referee did a good job to stay out of that sort of stuff and kept the game flowing. Um, Rassi Rasmus obviously talked about the team, talked about the goal kicking. He his main thing about the team is obviously uh, Hundre Pola. Is he gonna be? He, he actually hinted that Hundre Pola will be playing against Tonga, but he's not. He's not gonna guarantee that Hundre Pola is better than Manuel Bok uh, in any sense. You know, he, you know, he's gonna ease him into it. It's not gonna guarantee that he's gonna be playing the quarterfinals ahead of Manuel Bok. Uh, Rasi did talk about how he's pretty happy about Manuel Bok's you know game overall game. Maybe the the goal kicking is an issue, but. You know, as a playmaker, Razi Rasmus is pretty happy with uh, with what it, what Man in the Box brings to the table. And obviously, Razi no don't want to just hammering. You know, the one guy, the one issue. He also talks about the other parts, like the lineout throws on Dion Fury when when arrive. You know, the other areas that the opportunities were lost. Uh, Faf the close missing goals as well. So he talks about like a whole you know package of issues, not just trying to put everything on one player sort of thing, which I think is quite nice for a head coach to do. Uh, similar things was echoed in the post-match, you know, uh, post-match, in, uh, you know, what do you call it, interviews be- with uh, Jax Nienaba and Sia Khaleesi. You know, Jax basically came out and said, you know, it's not the goal kicking, it's all the other opportunities that we didn't capitalize, which I do agree. And I, I did feel like, you know, the Springboks was able to create more opportunities in Ireland, but they weren't able to capitalize those. They weren't able to ex- polish, get those, um, executions polished up for 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 the for the match. So it's really hard to see how the team like backs their own ma- teammate, backs their own their, uh, backs their own players, and um, keep me things positive and keep everyone you know spirited. Obviously, the big news came out of France on the week was you know the injury to Anton Dupont. He fractured uh, basically his cheekbone, and this was uh, done by Jonathan Dazel of Namibia who received a five-week ban as a result of it. Uh, the good news is, so he's had a fractured, yeah, basically fractured cheekbone, fractured face. Uh, he's had a surgery done. And at the moment, the French camp has said that he will be ready to play. Yeah, so whether there's some speculation that he might be wearing like a mask, some sort of protective gear. I mean, he probably can just wear headgear, to be honest. But, um, I mean, obviously, he, the rest of his body is going to be okay and it's going to be a bit, bit of pain. But um, if he's if he wants to do it, and if the doctors clear him, uh, I'm sure he can. You know, Richie McCall played with uh, what broken foot, essentially fractured foot, in the 2011 Rugby World Cup. Uh, so it's not like, and that would have been a lot worse because you, you know it actually affects your movement, a cheekbone. Um, I don't know. I I I'm not a doctor, but I don't think I I really don't think it's gonna be that much worse. Not like in terms of like. Yeah, I mean, a cheekbone is pretty minor compared to that, in my opinion. But we'll have to see. So, yeah, that's really good news for the French because Dupont is their captain and it's their best player in the world at the moment. So, yeah, let's have a look at the uh, the, the web of lies. Let's try to untangle the web of lies from Eddie Jones um, of his, you know, uh, of his commitment to Rugby Australia, let's say. So, Eddie Jones obviously had the, you know, obviously always comes out and say, you know, oh, um, I've let the team down. It's my fault, my responsibility. You know that he is lying because before the match, he essentially says that he's planning to win the game. His goal is to win the game. And before the Rugby World Cup, he said his goal is to win the Rugby World Cup. That's it. And as soon as he lost, he said, oh, no, I'm just building for the future, guys. Right? I'm just building for the future, you know? You know, you take some time. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna give me four more years, please, right? So that's already inconsistent in his in his own rhetorics. But obviously, the big one is the reveal by Sydney Morning Herald. We can't watch this because can't read this because it's obviously paywalled. But it's revealed that um that he had a Zoom meeting two weeks before setting out for the Rugby World Cup. So yeah, and that's pretty much when selections were done. So maybe that could have influenced his decisions to cut Michael Hooper. Who knows? But this uh, this has been confirmed. Uh, Tom D 
Dyson has confirmed that this was the case before the Rugby World Cup. So obviously, and this was re- uh, this article was released like literally the night or so before the game the, against Wales. And Eddie Jones has to, you know, settle the rumors inside the, the uh, uh, you know, everywhere inside the team and amongst the... Um, Amongst the, uh, the 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 CEOs, upper upper um, the people above him, right? So obviously Phil Wall came out, who is the CEO, and said that this Eddie Jones told him there's nothing to it. You know, in the end, everybody is focused on playing Wales this weekend. Let's just move on. And then the team, you know, Will Skelton has come out and said, you know, Eddie told him this that you know has denied it. Uh, everybody trusts what Eddie says. Don't think there was there was anything that's distracting and uh we're just focusing on preparations um he's uh, you know he uh, you know what's his name will skelton said that you know they have the players have full trust in eddie jones so eddie jones is denied with his players denied with the ceo and then after the match uh he was questioned again by the press and then he once again said i don't know what you're talking about and the and the press actually got really heated. If you're going to go watch it, it's quite entertaining, actually. And the press was, one of the guys was basically like, hey, uh, Eddie, could you confirm that you're not going to be the Japanese coach in 12 months' time? And Eddie's like, Eddie was like, I'm committed to Rugby Australia. And then the guy asked again, can you confirm that you are not going to be the head coach of Japan in 12 months? And Eddie said again, Instead of saying, I can confirm. Instead of saying, like, yeah, I confirm I'm not going to be Japanese coach. Eddie said again, I am committed to, rug- uh, to, 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 to Australian rugby right now, right? So he, he didn't actually deny that he's not going to be the coach of Japan in a year. But he, he's firm on the fact that he's going to be an Australian coach. And then another coach, uh, Eddie Jones, was like, I don't want to hear any more of this. I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm, this is... This is uh this is, I don't want to hear anybody's question from anymore. I don't want to answer anybody's question anymore. I'm gonna leave. You ask me again. So one of the reporters had the smarts to ask the captain, which was Dave Pareki, basically the same question, like how did this affect the team? And Dave Pareki was like, oh, it really didn't affect the team. Some players, you know, may have heard about it, but we're just focused on their jobs. And yeah, clearly something happened. Something was talked about. Uh, and he's just like pretending you're trying to wave it off. So. Uh, after that, Eddie Jones was like, "Any more questions about this? We're done. Okay? Like, we're, this is this is too much. Okay, we're, I don't want to talk about it." And the so obviously this whole show was analyzed by people all over the world. Some body language expert comes out and said that Eddie Jones was lying. They even said that the uh, the captain was lying, saying that he didn't really know what's what, what, what was happening. We were, we were you know we already got confirmation on that because uh, Will Skelton has said later, you know, like we just told you. Will Skelton has confirmed that there was some discussion between Eddie Jones and the players prior to the match, and Eddie Jones denied any any involvement. And then, obviously, the latest news that just came out, the chairman, Hamish McLennan, this guy, who hired Eddie Jones, by the way, he's the guy that decided that Dave Rennie should be sacked and they should bring in Eddie Jones. Uh, McLennan basically said that He's fully aware a job offer was made to, to Eddie Jones in an interview yesterday. Or oh, actually today. Or oh, yesterday. Yeah. So Eddie Jones confirmed by his boss, the guy who hired him, that he's hired, he's, he had an interview with, with Japan. But yeah. And this is a quote. I understand that Eddie has an outstanding offer from Japan. They respect his many outstanding coaching achievements. I accept his word. There is nothing in it, essentially. So Eddie Jones definitely had an interview with Japan. and definitely has an offer in Japan because the CEO has confirmed it from Australia. Yeah. And to go out to, to tell his teammate, tell his team that there's nothing, this, 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 there's nothing in it. And then to, to tell the press that it doesn't know what they're talking about. Lying right there. Straight out of his mouth. So there's going to be an ex- external review for Eddie Jones. And obviously, the a lot of you, again, once we're talking about Eddie Jones is building for the future, there's no way someone's going to, the decision to to sack Dave Rennie 
and then to bring Eddie Jones in, the, the, the discussion was going to be, hey, just do whatever you want, Eddie Jones, um, and, and, and not not in the line and, and not set any targets for the current World Cup. Uh, and, and that has been confirmed by Phil Ward, the CEO, that the discussion for it with Eddie Jones, the target is a semi-final for the Wallabies. So Eddie Jones coming out and said they're building for the future. That was not the plan. That was not the reason they hired him. That was not the pre pretense to fire Dave Rennie. Okay? The pretense was that Eddie Jones is going to take the Wallabies to a semi-final. That was the reason they fired. That was the reason they hired him. Thus, the firing to Dave Rennie. That, and that is confirmed by the CEO, Phil Wall. So, Eddie Jones, uh, that's why he's, that's why he's, you know, like I mentioned right at the beginning of the this, this whole re- period report, his own statements are contradicting. He says before a match that he's looking at winning, taking the Wallabies, you know, to, to, to the next, to the quarterfinals. And then after the match, he's saying that his main focus is to build the depth, uh, to build a younger team. So he's contradicting himself because the CEO, the initial goal to hire that, that was set for him when hired him was to take the team to the semifinals. And Eddie Jones has made a massive blunder and he's trying to find excuses to cover his own stupid decisions. Yeah. So now, yeah, look, look at the look at the other way. Warren Gatlin has taken his team from absolute the depths of hell, right? Wales was so bad. Uh, when Warren Gatlin took over, they lost to Italy, they lost to Georgia at home. Uh, they finished fifth in the Six Nations when Warren Gatlin took over, and they were the 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 Wales Rugby Union was like stifled by financial issues. Players were not able to confirm a contract because uh, uh, the the Wales Rugby Union didn't have the ability to 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 issue budget for the clubs. So people were literally living in limbo,s not knowing they're gonna have enough money. Uh, to pay off their mortgages, players. And that has affected players' performances on the field. And Warren Gallen come in with that sort of issues in front of him. And basically, the secret, if you want to go through this, is just hard work, mate. He worked hard backstage. He worked hard with the players. He encouraged the players. Good support. And then he got them through. And he's now in the quarterfinals. Uh, taking a team that's probably in a lot worse situations than the Wallabies were. No, definitely a lot worse situation than the Wallabies were. And Warren Gallen has turned that around. And Eddie Jones managed to, to take that opportunity and try to lie his way through it. That's the difference. So obviously, Warren Gatlin's second favorite son, uh, with obviously his own son sitting third, Brent. Brent. And, uh, and obviously his favorite son is Gareth Anscombe. We all know that. Um... His, uh, his second favorite son, the black sheep of the family, actually. Dan Bigger is suffering a bit of a, you know, uh, what is it? B- a bicep bicep injury? What is it? Yeah, a pec, a little bit of pec injury. And it's expected to be out for a couple of weeks, according to Warren Gatlin. So, yeah, uh, I guess he's have to get the uh, Anscombe out of the bubble, bubble wraps and put him on the field. Uh, speaking of Anscombe, he's pretty good. He um on the weekend he almost broke Dan Bigger's record. He missed like a couple of kicks where he, where he had landed one of them. He could have like leveled or broken Dan Bigger's all time scoring point scoring record in one single match. Anscom is um in case you don't know was the guy that led the Welsh team to the Grand Slam in 2019, and he was injured in the warm up matches. And Warren Gatlin has never <laughs> forgotten that. And uh, thus, if you if you watch the warm up, you would notice that Gareth Anskin was sitting in front of the coaching box, in casual clothing, where Warren Gatlin can see him at all times, right? And Dan Bigger was sent out on the field in the warm up matches with all the rookies and get flogged and embarrassed in front of uh, in front of uh, in front of the fans, right? So that tells you that tells you how much Warren Gatlin wants to keep Gareth Anskin protected <laughs> for the World Cup. Didn't want him to get injured again before the kickoff. And uh, yes, so obviously with the Springboks losing to Ireland and securing a very important losing bonus point, Scotland currently, uh, you know, if everything goes right, they just need bonus points against 
They've already got the bonus point over Tonga, so they just need bonus point against Romania, which is very likely to do so. And then it'll be basically a death match against uh, against Ireland. And if if Scotland can beat Ireland by more than seven, which means denying Ireland a bonus point, they can actually eliminate Ireland from the from the from the game and advance into the quarterfinals. Yeah, that's how the score currently stands. And uh, yeah, really, really interesting couple of weeks coming up. And that will be a massive match to watch. And Scotland, like I said, who knows what's going to happen. Scotland is uh, set out to impress some people. So All Blacks have announced their team to play against Italy. The death match. A lot of you guys in the comments section saying that the All Blacks are going to lose to Italy. <laughs> uh, guys, no, no. The black jersey... It's not the Wallabies jersey. People actually care about what they're doing. So not likely. And uh, the, the All Blacks obviously has put on a very strong team against Italy. Um, so yeah, let's go through a team with the return of Jordi Barrett. So Ofa Tuonga Fasi obviously comes in number one jersey with Ethan De Groot. Still suspended till quarterfinals. Lucky only to the quarterfinals. So uh, Ofa Tuonga Fasi comes in number one. Cody Taylor, the veteran, the best hooker right now, most informal hooker right now, comes in at number two. Nipol Laulala, number three. Brody Retallics, number four. Scotty Barrett, number five. That's that's the top two combo for, for the All Blacks. Um, having Sam Wylock on the bench. Shannon Frizzell returns. The massive return. Shannon Frizzell has been so huge for the All Blacks uh, in like, you know, beating South Africa uh, in the in the rugby championship. Like his carry game, this, the, the, the physicality brings is so big that having him returning at a blindside flanker is absolutely massive for the All Blacks. Dalton Pavali comes in number seven. Uh, Adi Savia is the captain of number 8 jersey. Aaron Smith comes in number 9. Richie Mwonga returns to the number 10 jersey. Mark Talea gets number 11. Uh, Jordi Barrett also returns from a legal, legal bit of injury uh, to number 12 jersey. Riku Yuwani, the most exciting outside center in the world right now, uh, returns to the number 13 jersey. Will Jordan, number 14. And Bowden Barrett comes back at number 15. In the reserves, Dan Coles, the veteran, gets caught in ahead. Of Somosani Takiyaho, which kind of surprised me a little bit. I thought for sure Takiyaho needed more game time. He looked very rusty. Uh, Tamaki Williams gets a nod at the number 17 jersey. Uh, Tyrell Lomax, a massive, another massive, massive return, uh, comes to number 18 jersey. He had a cut on his leg uh, after playing against, uh, who was it? Was it against uh, against South Africa, I think it was? And now uh, he basically had yeah, a massive loss for the All Blacks. Tyre, oh, no, it was against, was it against France or South Africa? But yeah, he had a cut on his leg and uh, he's back to ready to go, which is really, really good. So Tyrell Lomax is the the rock that the All Blacks need in the tight head position. Very important. Samuel Wallow comes in at number nine. Uh, Sam Kang, the other the, the, the actual captain, will be on the bench at number 20. He also had a bit of an injury, so he's getting back is into the game. Cam Royga, one of the most exciting machines that the Ian Foster has unearthed for the number nine jersey. And the Damon McKenzie get the number 22 jersey. I'm very excited to see DMAC play again. I mean, he's very exciting in Super Rugby. He hasn't been given much opportunities, but um, I really want to see him. And he's, he's struggled at times in big games. He's one of those players who plays really well in club rugby, but he just, yeah, for so many years now, he just really hasn't delivered in the big stage. And this is another opportunity for him. And finally, number 23, Antoine Leonard Brown will come in for for uh, one of the, maybe for Rico Iwani. And Jordi Barrett might move to fullback. And I don't know, Demi McKenzie will be coming at 10. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, this will be a very interesting match, to say the least. Italy also announced their team. You can go have a read their team uh, if you want. We're going to move on from that. Uh, so for England, there was some very interesting setup on the weekend when they played against Chile. They had three playmakers on the field at one point with Owen Farrell, George Ford, and Marcus Smith at fullback. So Owen Farrell, obviously, out the center. George Ford at 10, and Marcus Smith at fullback. Uh, seeing Marcus Smith at fullback, really kind of like, Really good. He's really good at fullback. He's a completely different play style from George, uh, from from um from what's his name from from Freddie Stewart. You know, he's he given that space that he he's a fullback. He's really able to do a lot of playmaking. Like the speed that he has, he can really quickly switch between different attack points on the field and very very dangerous with that extra bit of space that's given to him. And uh, I really think that it could be this could be a permanent position for him and probably. Be like depends on the on the game, depends on the conditions. If it's raining or something, you can have Freddie Stewart starting. If it's like you know, like a like a more open style of rugby you're looking for, Marcus Smith can definitely a better option at fullback because 
Furtis Jewel is not going to be a playmaker. He's just going to be really good on a high ball, whereas Marcus Smith uh, can actually possess a threat uh, on the field, which is something that England def desperately needs, just the threat on the field. They have plenty of muscle, plenty of power up front, but they need some more threats. Uh, people can create space for, for players around them in the back line. And that was really impressive. He almost reminded me when Bowden Barry first took up the fullback jersey uh, for the All Blacks. Uh, he's not really the same as, as you know, 2019 George Bowden, Bowden Barry in the fullback position, uh, but he was so electric. And uh, yeah, Mark Smith looked very much like that when he was uh, wearing that 15 jersey. Uh, Henry Arundel also became uh, leveled the record, scoring five tries against Chile. It was quite easy. I was hoping for a sixth one, but didn't quite get there. And uh, there, with that being said, there's some rumors that came out that four of the top English players are looking at going to play in France. Uh, just like you know rugby in, 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 in New Zealand, if you play overseas, you're not be eligible to selection for England rugby. And the four players are Kyle Sinclair, Elliot Daly, Will Stewart, and Lewis Lutman, very, very big names. And uh, that'll be a huge loss for England. I mean, obviously, the, uh, they have financial issues as well in England. So maybe that's, you know, they don't have to afford the players to keep them on the rosters, these big names. Yeah, so big issues coming up for England. Maybe they have to look at uh, some alternative ways to keep their players in the England squad. Maybe have like, you know, like, a, like Australians, you know, three overseas player rules or whatever. But um, yeah, so anyway, guys, thanks for watching this uh, news weekly report. Let me know your thoughts on Eddie Jones' circle of lies, web of lies. And uh, thanks to everybody who donate money and support me with YouTube membership and Patreon. I do appreciate it. Uh, you literally buy my coffee and, you know, pays all my bills. And uh, it's very kind of you. And uh, thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you guys later this week for more reviews uh the stream box team hasn't been announced so when that comes out we'll be doing that and uh yeah thanks for watching and uh, see you guys later this week have a good one cheers